Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the uh, Legislative Action and Community Engagement Committee. Um, we have a pretty packed agenda, um, which is not uncommon for this committee. Um, so we'll get started. Um, so the first thing I want to do, we're going to go just a little bit out of order, is start with the uh, the delegate assembly resolution review. Um, I think I had mentioned to a couple of you, this is actually a record number of resolutions that were submitted for um, the delegate assembly. Um, there were a couple of districts that um, submitted like three or four resolutions on their own. Um, and so some of them were fairly, you know, a little bit similar. They had to do with the 2% cap. Um, some of them were different, but I just wanted to, um, because this is the last meeting before the delegate assembly, sort of go through them um, and just discuss briefly each one. All of them? Um, I guess we can pick one of you. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't. It's not <laughs> 13 resolutions. Is, is <laughs> it, this is, no, that's not what no, this, uh, no, I didn't, I had It's so 172 pages, yeah, so I, I that's why I, I, I sort of got a new printer, I don't, and my other one died, I think, from being here on this one. So right. I, don't, I don't need this one to go to. All right, so we can pick a few to look at, the ones that maybe are important to our district, or maybe that yeah. we want to yeah. discuss the pros and cons of prior to the, uh, Delegate assembly. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one, I would say, just because I think this was, you know, sort of a discussion, um, is the resolution number three, which is the flexibility with virtual learning. Mm -hmm. um, so that's on page seventy-one. If you um, have your the handbook handy, um, I know yeah. most of us have the computers here. And Gail, we'll keep you covered. <laughs> like, I don't need this. I'm not using. I think what? they could probably, I would say, not you guys probably look on. We're just going to sort of I'll look on with a, a man. Yeah. read through it. Um, so I actually was fortunate to be on the resolution subcommittee for NJSBA um, as the uh, representative from District 14. I believe that we are automatically put onto the resolution subcommittee. So um, Mr. Strom, who had been the uh, prior District 14 representative, um, had left his position, resigned, retired. I guess from uh, his James Burke Board of Ed role. Um, and so then as the alternate, I had um, taken his place. So I appreciate the years he spent on these committees. Um, but we actually had three different subcommittee meetings because there was such a large number of resolutions to go through. Um, so basically, um, the best way I think to do this was just to read the synopsis because it sort of gives us an overview of what it's about. Um, and I'll, I'll send this out. All board members do have access mm -hmm. to this because it is in executive context. Yeah, so you can see it. the details. Yeah. Um, but if anybody wants to hear any specifics about it, I'm always happy to discuss as well. So, um, you want to raise it? You want to read? That would be wonderful. Sure. Okay, so resolution number three from the Plainfield Board of Education, Union County, seeks to supplement file code 6114 emergencies and disaster preparedness and the NJSBA's Manual of Physicians and Policies on Education under the subheading School Cancellations with additional policy language broadening its scope. More specifically, the resolution seeks to enumerate virtual or remote instruction as an option that should be available to local boards of education in lieu of closing their schools in certain situations. Additionally, the proposed resolution seeks to have this option available for up to 10% of a local board of education school days and as needed for weather related issues, unsafe increases in COVID 19 locally, and other emergencies. Like we were talking about this last night a little bit, I feel like. Right. Um, so basically, it would make it a local decision whether or not to go virtual or remote. Um, right. Without having to go to kind of superintendent. And right. And basically, just you know, for the for information for, for the public's knowledge. These resolutions are not us putting anything into law mm -hmm. um, or anything like that. What essentially happens is these are submitted by various boards of education that are then reviewed by NGS, NJSBA uh, staff members, which are then um, brought to the resolution subcommittee to review and then to the full delegate assembly. Um, and there's one delegate from each board of education that then votes on these. And should these be successful when they're voted upon, they become part of the um, manual of positions and policies of, in education for New Jersey School Board Association. 
Um, and then that is used um, to reach out to our representatives at the Senate and assembly um, in terms of potentially having laws amended or created or things of that nature. So just because this was new to me a few years ago. So um, I just wanted to sort of share that that's the purpose of what the, um, the delegate assembly has. So I guess, do you guys have any thoughts about this specific resolution? I go both ways on it I because do. I do. feel like kids should have snow day, <laughs> right? You know, like to, to to take that away is, but at the same time, nobody likes to have days checked on to the end of the year or their spring break or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I would like to. I mean, if it is something that's going to go into place, then maybe you know, if we're up to local boards, maybe you use your snow days and then in place of adding days, taking away extra. You know, days from spring break or tacking on to the end of the year, then you could use a virtual day if you needed to. But I would not like to see you know kids lose their. But some districts don't have built-in snow days, so I don't know how that. <coughs> Elizabeth, would affect Elizabeth, that. Elizabeth doesn't have built-in snow days. They tack on to the I end of the year. I don't think Brunswick does. And um, my daughter, actually, I have my grandson because East Brunswick gets out a week before New Brunswick because they tack them on towards the end. So it, it's tough. I mean, I, I would say if it's one day, I would say give them the snow day. If it's a situation where a building is something wrong with the building, which I think East Brunswick had done, something rupture in the high school mm -hmm. last year, they had to close the high school for a week. Yes, I think not to lose the learning that way. I think the virtual learning when it's a, a, maybe it could be an established time period of time by the district of when you would go to uh, virtual learning. Right, so that was actually allowed because it had to go to the county superintendent. You're, you're still, you are allowed now for virtual instruction, but you have to have approval from the county superintendent. Oh. So in that instance, when they knew the high school had to be closed for an extended period, right. they went to the county superintendent, got the approval, and they were able to, you know, use remote right. instructions so that the days counted towards the school year. I mean, honestly, I would, I'm honestly would lean towards no. On this resolution, I feel like unless there was more language that would be added to it to say like not to take away right that it would be after the use after the use of, of building days. Yeah, I think the difficulty with any general opinion on this is that it's very specific to an individual district. Mm -hmm. Right. For instance, some districts like use our high school as an example. All of our students have one-to-one -one technology in their hand. So to pivot to a remote situation could be very, very quick and almost instantaneous, right? We need to provide the staff an opportunity to get things and be prepared outside, but the students overwhelmingly will be ready to roll. Um, that's a different story at the elementary school because the students aren't going home with technology. So there's a lead time that would be involved in just you know, mm -hmm. distributing and preparing in order to meet the threshold of what my expectation would be for a remote instruction, yes, yeah. right, which wouldn't just be send worksheets home and right. not engage with the teacher. So, um, I think that's the difficulty in a clearly this district has a purpose for submitting this, and maybe they're one to one K pop K mm -hmm. K twelve, right, yeah. and they they could pivot on the on a heartbeat, and they've had a situation where maybe some some ask that they had was not handled in a responsive timeline. We've had very uh, responsive uh, interactions with our county superintendent. It sounds like East Brunswick did when they had their situation. So I would say that's my, my opinion yeah. on this because it's a very specific and personalized piece and that may be why the legislation never really got traction because again, to make legislation that allows something, there's not you can't a one pen, one yeah. broad sweep doesn't fix it. Oh, yeah. That same opportunity curve just depends on the in the, that's what says up here in the recommendation. Depends on each in the individualized district mm -hmm. and what they have in place. Right. So it is a it is a tough situation. Right. All right. Um so let's move to and was that really helpful? <laughs> like, well, it's, it's always helpful. I, Anything you say is helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um let's move to resolution number four. Um, which is on page 79. Uh, Dr. Kaku, I feel like I'm teaching now. Would you like to read this one? <laughs> if you have it, it's like if not, I can do, do it for you. Page 79. 
Right, it's technically 84 in the in the attachment, yeah. 79 in the handbook. So resolution number four from the Plainfield Board of Education Union County proposes replacement policy language of NJSBA's Manual of Policies and Positions on Education, file code number 6171.4, Special Education Tuition Costs, providing that the NJSBA believes that there should be a 2% cap placed on the annual tuition increase imposed on school districts by approved public and private schools that charge tuition to educate students. Additionally, Plainfield seeks to remove the following language from the same file code number 6171.4. Public schools should proceed fair consideration in determining their special education tuition rate. Great. So I think this is something that we've really you know, seen, and I know that there are a lot of other districts that are, are being impacted by it as well. Um, because, you know, we are all bound to that 2% cap unless, you know, you go to override it or their legislature takes action. Like, there's only a very few certain amount of ways where you can do that. However, a lot of times the tuition that is coming from some of these out of district places can exceed that 2%. Um, and, you know, certainly you want to create, you know, you want to provide the least restrictive environment for all students and they need to get the services that they want. So you can't not send students to these places. However, it then becomes a, a financial difficulty. I feel for districts when, you know, I, maybe Dr. Lehman, you might have more of an exact, or at least a type of number amount that there's a change each year. Like I know that the tuition for some of the charter schools that we have sent to um, that's increased more than 2% in, you know, year by year, um, which then takes money out of other line items because that amount is increasing as much as it is. So there are many, many uh, items within the budget that are growing in excess of the cap, mm -hmm. right? So there are definitely different thoughts of how to manage that. So it sounds like uh, playing field is has some experience with a significant increase in their out of out of district tuition costs, um, specifically in the area of, as they define special ed or special programs. Um, we certainly see increases in tuition uh, many times or in excess of the what we would consider a 2% increase. Um, I would say equally as challenging are transportation costs. Um, they are increasing much more rapidly than, uh, um, you know, we could ever cover with our 2% cap. So, um, you know, certainly I think this is one area. Transportation costs, like I said, is another huge area. I mean, everything across the board, food costs, uh, electricity costs, gas costs, diesel costs, everything is increasing above that 2% rate. So, you know, this is a targeted attempt to control costs on their special special education tuition. I think another way to take a look at this is revisit the two percent cap in general, because then you're not targeting specific elements of within your budget. You're looking at a broader uh, increase to your to your general funds that you could have accessible. Um, so that's kind of my read on this. The, again, these are all real personalized. So they, they clearly have a reason to bring this out. Right. Um, it has negatively impacted them to the point where they maybe have had to make changes. If you dig a little deeper, it shows that you know there's an affirmative or a, a not affirmative vote on something. So maybe they even went out to vote and something got voted down or mm -hmm. uh, whatever they were talking about in here. So my recommendation, I'm not going to give you a recommendation on a position on this. I'm right. going to tell you that. Costs across the board are increasing faster than we have embedded in our 2% increase to the tax levy uh, across the board and almost everywhere you can look and include staffing costs. You know, to be competitive in the labor market, whether it's the certificated staff and non certificated staff uh, anywhere, you're looking at a more than a 2% increase. So I have to agree with Dr. Lane. I don't like the pinpointing of the um, special ed. Like he said, 2% across the board, check all lines, not just, you know, they might have had an issue with their special ed line, right. and that's why it's putting out there. And, yeah. and I disagree with that 
tremendously. Mm -hmm. I don't want to isolate special ed for anything. Right. I think it's equal with everybody else. And yeah, I agree. I think it's there's really there's two sides, right? There's the out of like the the cost that the district cannot control, right? That's that's the cost that comes from out of our district. You know, whether it's something for you know infrastructure or something for you know special education services. Um, food costs, th things that we really have little control over versus things in district that can be controlled. Um, so I certainly can appreciate the idea that maybe the more broad span of required services or required um, expenditures um, be that you know, a district has to have in place um, being limited. So I guess that's sort of where the difference would be versus something in district that we have slightly more control over, but even then, not always, right? Because, you know, like Dr. Lane said, if you want to be competitive, you know, the, if we want to attract the best teachers, we have to provide things in order to do that. I think some of these, and I have, um, I'm familiar with the system and how they use it, is they are geared to their district. They're bringing it to the delegate assembly, hoping that that will take care of a solution that they have in their district right now. The delegate assembly has to be there with these resolutions for all districts. So if somebody comes in, the resolution will actually help a lot of us, then I totally agree. But to me, coming just for themselves, mm -hmm. I disagree. Well, Mr. Payne, I feel like that is a good segue into the next resolution that I wanted oh. to review. So good job. Oh, <laughs> it's the full day kindergarten. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Resolution number oh, three, yeah. which is payment in lieu of taxes. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, let's look at the full day kindergarten one. Is that that one is before? No, or? No. I don't know. I know. Okay. I so think it's after. We can look at uh, number eight first. We'll go in order. So payment in lieu of taxes. Um, which is something I knew nothing about prior to being a board member. Um, so I always found it really interesting now to even while we were in our resolution subcommittee meeting, I was listening and learning. Um, so that is page 111. 116 if we're gonna type it into the Yeah. Is that easier if I say the yeah, okay. the number, yeah, 116. So 116 in the attachment. Mm -hmm. um, you would like to read this one? I'm reading the wrong one. Resolution number eight from the Toms River Board of Education, Ocean County, proposes revised language for NJSBA's Manual of Positions and Policies on Education, File Code 3220, indicating that all real estate developments utilizing Payment and lieu tax of taxes, which I know Kate is one of your <laughs> little idiosyncrasies that you're asking my call. Um, pilot program should be included in any statewide equalized valuation calculation and impacts the local education agency's share of state education and determines local fair share. I like that. Mm -hmm. You like the story? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that again? Tom's River. Tom's River. River. Tom's River and Plainfield, they were the two districts that submitted that quite, quite a few yeah. um, resolutions. And did they lose a lot of their funding? Tom's like River um, did, I know that yeah. for a fact, yeah. um, which I'll explain a little bit more once we get to the next the kindergarten resolution. Um, Plainfield, I don't know for sure, um, but I do know that they submitted um, several resolutions. Um, so any other thoughts about this one? I think that's a yes. I, yeah, I, guess. I, I say yes on that one. Yeah. Right. Well, that's easy. Yeah. I don't think anybody would argue. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. So let's move to the full day kindergarten one. Page 130. Thank you. I have a, I usually use a math book and I still you think I'd be used to this, but <laughs> just type 130 in the right. little PDF search bar. <laughs> Katie, that's genius. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. Thanks, Katie. All right. Um, PC user here. Yeah, we have to Tom's River again. Yep. Yeah. All right, Katie, you're the kindergarten teacher here, so go ahead and read this. Resolution number 10 from the Tom's River Regional School District proposes new policy language providing that NJSBA believes full day kindergarten should be a required grade in New Jersey public schools to help local education agencies facilitate instruction 
and mastery of the New Jersey student learning standards and this mandate should be supported through a well thought out school funding yes. formula. Yes. All of that is a yes. All of that is yes. So, yes. I'm going to give you guys a little uh, piece of information that they did the New Jersey School Board Association did not support this resolution. And then the resolution subcommittee did not support the resolution. They supported the New Jersey School Board not supporting it, which is really confusing when we discuss it. And I, I said you guys really have the wrong representative. But I also here. wonder if it's because it doesn't fulfill a large need. Like there's so many districts so, that don't have that that, that Right. Had full day kindergarten that it's not right. a, a right. thing that they're concerned with. So Tom's River submitted this. They currently have full day kindergarten. However, because of the extreme cuts that they have had due to us two, mm -hmm. they're potentially removing full day kindergarten. Um, and they, I think they had mentioned they may end up going out for a referendum to mm -hmm. see if they can um, override. The, the cost so that if they're um, moving forward. However, this is, you know, you had mentioned like individual districts putting in things that they need. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people in the subcommittee were unaware of like how few districts currently do not offer this. Mm -hmm. So then I gave them the list because I, I had that. Um, but, you know, the concern with this is that they certainly support full day kindergarten but they don't support making it a mandate because of the fact that there are these additional costs for infrastructure and things of that nature. Um, and the, specifically to the infrastructure, that's not something that would be um, covered through the funding formula. So that was one of the, um, the challenges that was brought up when this was discussed. Um, to which I said, well, if it's a mandate, hopefully we can, you know, put something in where they have to help support it, but that's just not how it is right now. So that's just a little background about what happened regarding this resolution. There was also an article that I saw today, and I can't remember where, but if I find it, I will remember to share it, um, stating that the legislature was talking about changing the mandated age to start school from mm -hmm. six to five. Okay, and then and then the conversation surrounding that was, well, if you're going to do that, then you also have to mandate kindergarten because kindergarten is not a mandate. So um, it hasn't really gone anywhere yet. I think it was just like in talks in the legislature and they were kind of like throwing it out there to see what kind of feedback it would get. But it kind of ties, ties yeah. directly to this because if they're going to change the mandate for the start date, starting age for school to five, then you have to have kindergarten. Because they're noticing, and I would agree, there's a there's a gap for students that start school at six as opposed to students who come in school for kindergarten at five. Right. And even more so now we're seeing with students that are starting at age three, right? I mean, I think it's wonderful that James Burke has this. So like please don't misunderstand, but the students who start ninth grade at Monroe Township High School. Some of them are coming in with an additional two and a half years mm -hmm. of public school education. And I guess we haven't technically gotten there yet because it was only a few years back. But, you know, and I certainly understand how it came to be. Um, but obviously, we want as much, you know, equity throughout education in the state as possible. And I think this is something that makes it really hard to provide that when. We don't even have something that most people think is a guarantee. I, I can't tell you just because I have a son in first grade and one who's going into kindergarten next year, how many parents aren't even aware that there is no full day kindergarten because right. they just assume that this, that, that it's there. And if you haven't been through it yet, you know, you just don't know. Um, What's my old saying that I've talked about your state mandate, state doesn't pay. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been saying that for years. They tell you to put these programs in. Two years later, they're going to take, you know, some kind of criteria or things. Oh, we're not doing it anymore. So there you go. You spend two years of money on a program that they told you to mandate. Um, and, and all of a sudden, they don't pay you mm -hmm. for canceling the program. And that's the same thing. And wasn't Governor Murphy, didn't he say something about Kindergarten or pre-K that he wanted to have something. Mm -hmm. He said by 2030. Great. Right. I know. 2030? We said all 100% universal right. pre-K or preschool by the year 2030. 2030. 
which you know is not as it's in kindergarten. It's, it's not as far away as you think. And yeah. no, you're right. Yeah. No, but you right. still have to do kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Like you, we're gonna go. Right. Garden is a, I don't know, it's a very important year mm -hmm. for these children, especially like if you don't go to my grandson's in pre-K in Howell, mm -hmm. and it was a lottery system, and he got picked. Mm -hmm. Not all the children got picked, mm -hmm. and it's free. Mm -hmm. um, but if you if you didn't get chosen, then you're paying for it. Mm -hmm. So. Um, then he's going to go to kindergarten this year, and it's a full day kindergarten. Right. So it's good for the parents that work. Um, they don't have to worry anymore. Yeah. But what about the ones here? I met somebody in CVS one time. <clears throat> I had a little boy, and I said, oh, half a day of school? And he said, oh, she said, oh, no, there's only half a day here. There's no full, full day kindergarten in Monroe. And I said, OK, this was before I got on the board. And I said, oh, I didn't realize that, like you said. You kind of assume that everybody has it. Right. So. Do we know if there are any students currently who go to um, the preschool program that is um, like the, if they're in the, one of the services, like the dis preschool disabled classes that are then not provided with full day kindergarten? Um, I knew I had heard from a parent who uh, had said her child was there full day, but now going into kindergarten. They were only eligible for the half day program. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's a student by student basis, but to her, that was like a big eye opener. Um, I wasn't sure if that's a common thing or if it's. So, in any of the preschool disabled programs that feed the full day kindergarten programs, mm -hmm. the transition from one student, the student from one program to the other is all driven by their IEP and their individual needs. Okay. So, if their needs, um, require them to have, to have the full day K program, and they would be in that class. Mm -hmm. If not, then they would be eligible to do the. Uh, okay, the, so it's the full. I know our our preschool teachers are fantastic. Um, that if their IEP no longer deems it necessary, that there is that chance where they go from being full day to not. Um, I mean, they have the option to go to BCE, and you know, I think I've said it before. Our BCE program is fantastic. They do a wonderful job. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily a given that they'll have full day kindergarten if their IEP no longer requires sure. that. So it's the least restrictive environment. Mm -hmm. That's that's the goal. So cycling back to comp compulsory school attendance, that's mm -hmm. S2970 uh, for discussion only. They I guess they received the committee received some testimony, but they did not take any action on it. Mm -hmm. So that's the rate the lowering the compulsory age to attend school from six to five. Mm -hmm. So S2970. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, all right. I mean, there, there are several more resolutions. Um, I don't think, unless there's any specific one any of you would like to discuss right now, um, I can just briefly say what they are. We don't go through them. Just there was one about artificial intelligence. I had actually, by the way, you said that. Mm -hmm. I had shared that with Ms. Bora because I know she was very excited after a workshop about artificial intelligence um, and how we're utilizing in our schools. And the resolution was just about putting a policy in place in districts, how to handle that. Um, there was, there's one about um, rejected resolutions, which I think, again, it's a very individualized concern, um, dual language requirements. Um, one about utilizing reserve funds for purchase of school vehicles, which again, is that specific um, going above the 2% cap in order to provide for transportation. Um, there is one regarding uh, the lawsuits for survivors of sexual assault, which is that there are a number of districts who have been um, hit with these lawsuits from, you know, things that have happened over 30 years ago um, that are becoming quite costly. And there aren't a lot of witnesses and things from that time. So um, the idea would be that it's going to be handled through funds on a state level rather than a local level. Um, polling places, um, that's the idea about getting them out of the schools. Um, mm -hmm. something about HIV, uh, which I can't remember exactly what was there. I think it was just looking at exactly what constitutes harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Um, and then another one that was about the 2% cap. Um, clearly there's a lot of, uh, discussion on that right now because of the final year and several of these districts taking this hit to which I always provide the other side of, well, we have these, um, districts that. We are 
going to sorry, to yourself. Um, we have these this we are district that has been having problems with that since you know before S2 was initiated. So I always provide that alternative view. Mm -hmm. You know, I certainly can understand why they are having trouble, right? Because you lose half of your funding over seven years. Um, but at the same time, we have this other side. So yeah. Um I think that's everything regarding delegate assembly. It's on May 18th. Um if anyone has any questions about that. Did you find somebody to go? Yes, I'm just going. Oh yeah, Sharma is going to be anything. Okay. <laughs> so um the time is at nine right. Friday the 18th from nine to twelve. Right. So right, it's at Mercer yeah. County College. They provide breakfast um, so you can get there early. It is great. It's usually done before 12 but yeah. because there are so many resolutions, there's a chance it <laughs> might not be. Yeah. Yeah. But I can go over it with you more in depth about what there is in the, the handout. And I'm sure it's Fabian. Yeah, we'll do it as well. All right, let's move to um, legislative update. Um, so I had sent out the last uh, legislative committee report, which um, had several bills that um, were discussed at the last legislative committee meeting. Um, the legislative committee was supposed to meet this Saturday, and it actually got rescheduled to June first. Um, so there is no new legislative update briefing in terms of what's here. But um, for the new board members, there's actually um, legislative updates that are sent out through New Jersey school boards as well. Um, and then there's also um, what's called school board notes, which is a weekly newsletter that often has updates on um, various bills that are. Uh, moving, whether they're being passed or being discussed. Um, so it's always a good place to look. Um, it's amazing how many bills are initiated, but then nothing mm. happens with them. Right. Um, so uh, just to look at a couple of them, um, one that I noticed has been passed um, was regarding uh, school meal information mm -hmm. that I thought was interesting. Um, it requires, uh, it's bill S530, at least that's what it was. Um, this is so just so you know, the Senate bills usually start with us and assembly bills will start with a. Um, and so 530 uh, says requires certain school meal information be provided to public school students, parents and requires school districts to request that families apply for school meals um, under certain circumstances. Um, so. I guess this sort of. Um, was a thought in my mind as to what we do in our district to make this information available to parents. I know that everyone has the opportunity to apply if they are interested um, and they receive it at the be beginning of the school year, I would assume. Um, but you know, I remember looking at the free and reduced lunch information being shocked that the reduced lunch threshold is not nearly as low as someone might think, right? So I don't have it in front of me, but like for a family of five for reduced lunch, it was something like the 50,000, 60,000, um, which, you know, certainly doesn't get you a lot nowadays, but it's not as low as you might've thought. So there may be people eligible that were not aware of it. Um, I guess, so my question would be, how do we communicate this at the beginning of the year? Um, is it, Sent home by paper? Is it in? I, can't, I honestly can't remember with it being May what we what was done. Is it in So again, this is the beginning of the year stuff that we'll be queuing up over the summer. I believe it's digitally sent through uh, some of the required paperwork mm -hmm. in the beginning of the school year. Okay. Um, it's not a. It's not something that we check right. who's handed in, who hasn't it's handed in, and then follow the phone calls. Um, you know, we, we certainly, as the year goes on, we can, if families come on board and we identify that, you know, they're struggling to, you know, get a meal during the day or something like that, we certainly provide them the resources again to complete the documentation. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we have, we have some schools that have a larger uh, free and reduced lunch population than other schools. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I haven't read through what the requirements are that this bill would require us to share or uh, I haven't gone through that yet. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak to whether we're in a process to already have that accessible or not, or um, 
you know, is it a daily lunch? Uh, like, what are they eating on a daily basis? So we have to communicate with the parents or something like that. I haven't, again, I haven't gone through that and seen that yet. So I don't have any comments on that. Dr. Lane, um, so what would you say right now would be a percentage of children that we have in free and reduced lunches? And would they basically be in elementaries? Or are they across, across the board? Uh, Give me a minute or two and I'll tell you thank you. better than I guess. Oh, thank you. While well, Dr. Lehman is uh, looking it up, which I appreciate, um, I remember, I don't remember when it was, as I was trying to figure out, there was a bill that was um, initiated, right? But I don't think, I don't know if there was ever any movement on it that would require families to either uh, input their school meal information or Opt out of that and force them to be taken action. Right. Um, and so I would definitely be curious and I can follow up on this to see if that is something um, that has moved. I mean, I'm guessing if it, there was final action on it, then we would have to take action anyway. But um, I, I almost like that idea just because I know that a lot of our grants, right, um, and our funding for certain programs. Mm -hmm. Um, is based on the percentage of students who are on free and reduced lunch. Um, and so I think that if people are willing to provide that information, even if they don't want to take advantage of free and reduced lunch, and it helps to increase the percentage that we have, it, um, it, it can't hurt um, as long as you also provide that option to opt out if you do not want to submit the form. Um, do you think that the population in Monroe compared to, another, say, another district in Middlesex County, where most of the children would be free and reduced lunches, that socially a child would not want to get a free lunch next to his friends? You know what I'm saying? The social atmosphere of trying to get it. It's not. So the students go through, they put in a code. Yeah. And it, every oh, student so puts in a code. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, you know. can't tell who has a free way, but. Thank you. As a fun story, my daughter thought that that code just got you all the food you wanted. And she'll appreciate me telling a story when she was in first grade. So she started just buying cookies for her class and everything. It was a big problem. In all of them. <laughs> it was great. Um, yeah, 7.6% within the district. And that's economically disadvantaged. So that's trend that translates to uh, usually it's driven by the free and reduced lunch. But I think the essence of that action was that there was a sentiment that that figure is being underreported due to the stigma. So yeah, that's, right. the, the that's what I'm trying to get to. So yeah. we, we, we find this a lot of times um, when we run programs that would command, let's say, a participation fee or whatever, because many times those students that would qualify don't have to pay that fee. Right. Um, but like we said, the stigma sometimes makes it an uncomfortable discussion to remind someone maybe of that designation or just to alert them of it. So I believe the essence was to, much like we do with the media consent form, everyone has to do it in order to get there or whatever. Right. And then that way we can run. So we don't even have to have that conversation. Yes. I'm glad. I mean, I just didn't know how it was done. So that's 22, 23. 7.6%. And that's the most updated uh, data. Yep. Previously, it was 4.7%. And then 2020, 2021 was 5.4. Mm -hmm. awesome. yeah. And it could be an increased response rate. Yeah. It could be, I mean, our town has certainly grown a little bit since coming out of the 2020, 2020, 2021 school year. Also, the yeah, that's probably living, isn't it? Everyone awesome. has mm -hmm. increased substantially. So, yeah. you know, hmm. that's interesting. do you think it's possible? I mean, for just to have our, our own information to know how many people are filling out the application. I'm guessing they only fill it out right now if they're eligible for the program. Um, so it, it might be that number. Um, I'm not sure. I, I guess I'd be curious to know if we were to ask people to either fill it out or opt out, if it might increase the amount of people who will apply for it. But I don't know if you can require that. That makes sense. I, no, I know what you're asking. Um, so my, I, I, my assumption, and I'm not familiar with our procedure for this at all, but my assumption would be the only paperwork being submitted are for those who wish to be utilized in the benefit. So we wouldn't really truly know what our participants. So if someone's missing the email or or is unaware or ignorant to the process, which we actually, you know, that's part of our some of our, our 
our procedure. We do tend to orient parents that may not be familiar with uh, what they're entitled to. That is part of the things that we do for some of the programs. Um, but that being said, there are uh, inevitably some people that are most likely slip through the cracks. Right. Um, but I don't imagine people are submitting a form to say, no, I don't think it's right. Uh, the parameters are outlined. Right. So mm -hmm. they know they meet the parameters. They submit yeah. if they're close. Maybe they submit. Uh, just to give an example um, of an additional kind of exposure opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we do do our uh, ESL parent nights. Mm -hmm. This year we had one in the beginning of the year, and we're going to have another one at the end of the year. Uh, and we share a wealth of resources, everything from the, the public library all the way through, uh, you know, voting applications. We provide them if, if they need them in, in multiple languages and things. And also we provide free and reduced lunch paperwork I think so that happens that's a that's a subgroup that I just identified but that happens across the board um anytime we can interface with a parent group uh that we think uh well any parent group that you know we have an opportunity to share information with and I think it's important to know that that designation can can change year to year yep. uh when as economic conditions and this is something that we know that parents aren't aware of so it, it, you know family plurals on hard times even if it's just temporarily you know, that that benefit would still be eligible for that. And this is something managed out of uh, Ms. Allen's office. Okay. So it's not even something the schools interface with. Mm -hmm. um, they will receive paperwork and things, but they send it to central office um, and her office processes that and manages that. And that's where all the numbers are audited from as well. Okay. Mrs. Jenkins, for the paperwork, what information do, does the school use it? Is that the financial information, economic slide? Yearly. Yeah, I, I don't. I actually, I don't know. Um, so our district sends it all. Yeah. The paper copy. Yeah. It's a big packet of paper. Yeah. So if you're going through it. There's a lot of details before you get to the part where you're filling out, like mm -hmm. how many kids are, or how many people are in your high school, where the money comes from, like mm -hmm. much. I actually so filled it up. That has to be um, financial so, information. Yes. It's our form. It's, but it's the minor form. Um, it's not, but I think the numbers are the same um, state, statewide. Right. It is, um, I don't know if the form itself is the same. It's um, but it's um, like the standard contact information. Sorry, I, it's, it's not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, sources of income, ethnicity, yeah. race. Um, total income, how often you receive income. Katie, you're teaching me so much today. All right, back to normal. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I got most of it now, of course. But uh, yeah, so annual income um, and where the income is received from, as well as if student, a child receives income, and that has to be listed. Um, whether it's like receiving social security benefits or things of that nature. Um, and then it actually on page one, which now Katie taught me, I can type in the numbers. It's so exciting. Um, it, it's not page one, of course, it's page two, but uh, it has the totals <laughs> the wrong way. There we go. So in order to be eligible uh, for a household of two, it's this is for free or reduced lunch. 36,482 for three is $45,991 in income. Um, so anything under that is then eligible okay. um, for four is 55,500 for five is 65,009 um, for six people in a household is 74,518. So while like, again, <clears throat> nowadays it's not that much money, it's more than I just always perceived in my head. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, I I want to look see if I can find that bill from last year, whenever it was about requiring people to either fill it out or opt out. Because um, I would love to see if there was any movement on that. But um, I think that at least now we can look at what is in that S five three zero that has been uh, moved forward. Um, so the next one that I wanted to look at was S two five four eight. Um, which authorizes a school district that moves its annual election to November to submit a separate proposal for additional spending for both the current year as well as the following year. Um, this is something that we sort of ran into when we were discussing our, our move to um, the April election, um, that if you currently have a November 
um, second question, the money can only be used for that year and not for the following year. Um, I tried to see if there has been any movement on this and for whatever reason, the bill search on the state legislator, it has it under state government wagering tourism and historic preservation. So I'm not quite sure. I only see it has been introduced in February from what I can see, but there's also other identical bills, which maybe did have movement. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's something that might be really helpful. Um, I know we, we learned a lot about moving the election um, to April. Um, and then even after we had done that, we had learned things such as the fact that it would have always had to have been two questions. Um, this is actually something that I had spoken to um, the business administrator in residence, I think is his official title, uh, Charlie Muller, um, who had actually shared that you could not include everything in one budget question. Um, if you wanted to exceed the 2% cap, you would have had to include anything over the 2% um, that was not covered by any of the adjustments, right? Like such as um, health care increases and all of that. Anything above that would have always had to be a second question. Um, and so then now with S4209, which um, removed the um, requirement for able districts to vote on their budget, it's just that question just like now. So it's very similar to November. Um, I, um, I know that, you know, it's been a discussion as to moving back to November. Um, I believe the rule with the state is that you cannot have two elections in the same year. So any move to November would have to go to November yeah. of 2025. Um, and so, but I think the language is, is that if you were going to, if you wanted to move from April to November, if you didn't have an April election, I believe, mm -hmm. it had to be submitted to the to the county by the third Tuesday in April, some, some date in some April, date. Oh, yeah, right. to the county that you wanted to move from April back to November. So um, that's not what, that is not a possibility to do for this year, obviously, I mean, you can't have two elections in one year. So there is time to have a fuller discussion of what moving the election back to November looks like. Um, you know, there, the pro is that then we don't pay for it, doesn't come. We don't have to put the $100,000 out for the election. Um, I also it, think what's really good is that then there's an increase in voter participation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for an April election, there was a good turnout, yes. but I never, I don't think you're ever going to have the same level of turnout in April or March yeah. or anything November. as you will in November. Um, so I think that that's another benefit to having it in November. Um, I also really like, I appreciate all the work that Alan did on the budget. Mm -hmm. It was such a rushed process, which I really think is a change that has to be made at the state level because it's the dates that are set from them, but um, it gives districts more time to review their budget. Um, like I know a lot of these other districts uh, still have not had to finalize their budget. I think it's coming soon that yeah. they've had this time, whereas we had to have ours done in March, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, Dr. Lehman and you know, Mr. Roy, like I appreciate that the administration had to do in order to get that ready as well. But um, I think that this is a conversation that, we, you know, we can have it here. And then, um, you know, I think Ms. Allen and, and Ms. Borah's finance yeah. chair, right? Um, Ms. Borah can, you know, probably discuss at the finance committee meeting, if not today, because I yeah. know there are we have a fact agenda a look, today. Yes, um, then possibly in June, because it's not an urgent matter. But I do think we want to make sure we have all of the relevant information. Um, and you know, I also found really interesting that um, this was, you know, what Mr. Mueller had shared with me that the ability to go to the municipality for April, which I know was something that had been discussed, was regarding the budget, everything within that 2% cap. So like one of the districts that had moved it to April had done so because they wanted to let voters decide whether or not they should even go up to the 2% cap or to not use any of that money. And if that failed, then the municipality could say, okay, well, we can, you know, discuss possibly you know, increasing up to 1% instead of 2%, but the additional spending, mm -hmm. so everything that was over, you know, the thorough and efficient education that was above that cap, 
that was never something that could be um, overridden by the municipality, um, which was something that I like. I, I think if you're new to this, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot for me, and I'm just like I've been doing it, but it was eye opening for me because I know like that had sort of been the discussion. But I think there there's a very small but important difference between being able to have the municipality look at the amount for the 2%, which is not possible now anyway, because as 429 got rid of that. So now April elections are essentially the same as November. The only difference is, is in November, you're still putting a vote, you'll be putting a vote out for the current year's budget. Right, so, so if you want to hear if there's any questions. Right, so if the, if the election is moved to November of 2025, the school year has already started and you're putting voting on a question in November of 2025, to impact that year, mm -hmm. right? Unless that bill that right. was there is passed, right? Although the reality, I looked at Robbinsville because they had also submitted um, a I don't want to call it a referendum, but it was an additional spending question um, to provide programs for their next school year. So for the 2024-2025 school year, but they had done it as a special election in March. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, it doesn't even have to be in April. If you wanted to do it for the following year, like if there was that need. Now that said, I would not want to do that because it has that additional. I cost. think if we can eliminate the additional cost, that is a huge, yes. oh, yeah. huge sell. Right, but I found that interesting that you're not required to be yeah. in April. Like it can be done. At least this is what happened in Robbinsville in other months as well. So right. that would but just something still, we still have to pay the hundred thousand. Right. 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 It did the Robbins bill and they actually had put it in a November um, as a second question and it had not passed. Um, and so then they had asked, I don't want to say identical, but very similar question in March um, for the following school year. And that did pass. Um, so I just think going forward, I think it's going to be an ongoing discussion. It's going to go into finance to talk about, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the, getting the board's thoughts on moving the election from April back to mm -hmm. November. Of course, we need, you know, we everybody's input. We certainly want to hear from Ms. Allen, we want to hear from administration on their thoughts. Right. Um, but if it's going to be moved, it would be moved from April 2025 to November 2025. Right. Right. Um, which like I know it extends our term longer. Personally, I didn't ever want it to move it in the first. I don't think anybody wanted to leave it, so but be done in December. <laughs> right. Um, but I think you know, for the benefit of not having the additional cost, not rushing the budget process, and knowing that the April election is essentially the same as November. It, looking and at it, it from the district point of view. And it's an increasing voter turnout. Right. Yes. Um, absolutely. Once we do move it to November, I believe well, that we cannot. And, yes, once you do move it to November, you're, it is locked in for four years. So right. once you move it back to November, you cannot change it back again, back to April for four years. Mm -hmm. And just to put out there, the other reason you can't move it like up to April 2024, this is something where, Gail, I don't know if you remember last year's meeting when we were discussing this. Um, Mr. Gagley already had mentioned that if you move an election up, there have been other purpose. districts yeah. that have had people uh, file lawsuits because their term right. was shortened. Yeah. So when we had discussed, like, could we do this last year, right? So instead of pushing the, oh my God, I can do this. But if we have the November 2023 election up, moving it up to April 2023, right. we, couldn't we couldn't because it would have shortened those board members' right. terms. So we had to push it out to November of no, April of 2024. Wow, this is hard. Yes. So we're sort of in that same situation now, right? Because if we were to push it up to April of 2025, five, yes, yeah. then we uh, would be doing that same action, which Mr. Right. Gagley already had said we need to avoid last year. Um, so the only thing I would contribute is uh, from the administrative point of view, as long as uh, we have an opportunity to share all the facts, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, financial or like anticipated curricular projects or technology rollouts and things like that. Just so we have a an open dialogue about this is what's in, this is what's ahead of us. This is what the reality is. Yeah. These are what's the potential projection for healthcare look like, or you know whatever we can uh, pull together at whatever benchmarks we yeah. can. Mm -hmm. um, some numbers will be much more accurate than others at, you know, mm -hmm. certain times we go through the year in the discussion process. Um, 
then we can, you know, yeah. provide the, provide the information to make an informed decision. Um, you know, because yeah. there are definitely benefits. I think there are, I think you argue benefits for both mm -hmm. time frames, and you have uh, challenges that come with both time yeah. frames. Right. Um, and there's opportunities for public input in both time frames, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the April time frame gives the public an opportunity to make a choice. Mm -hmm. about things that may or may not have to may or may not exist mm -hmm. whereas in november uh, you get a larger turnout um, and you get maybe a, a choice of something that could happen in the second half of the year but not necessarily the first half of the year because um, even with the november election i wouldn't anticipate any funding coming mm -hmm. from that yeah. till at least after the yeah. end of the new year so you're looking at a, a springtime yeah. project you know construction project or whatever yeah. would be on the on the horizon so um, lots of things to talk yeah. about, um, and we'd be welcome to provide as much information as we can to help an informed decision be made. Yep. So just to, well, we knew we weren't getting to everything on the agenda. We no. have the resolu delegate resol assembly that has 14 resolutions. That wasn't going to happen anyway. But um, with this S2452548, which allows for future year spending, if that was something that either has passed or does pass, um, is that something that we want to consider possibly writing in support of? Like, I know there's been a discussion at the Adrian School Board Legislative Committee um, in support of this because it provides more flexibility to utilize those funds the following year. Um, and it was actually this, along with the fact that we just had the election last mm -hmm. month, so it was fresh in my mind that made me feel like this would be a good discussion to have now and then, you know, discuss further with all the information uh, moving forward. But I'd be curious if this is something we wanted to pursue asking our um, elected officials at the state level to support, um, because then if there is that chance where you feel there, there may be a need, it's, I guess there's the possibility, I don't know when it would have to be put in place of putting this on a November 2024 ballot to be utilized for 2020 20 year. 526. Oh my God, these years are coming. Oh. Or hopefully having this pass, and so then we don't have to necessarily worry about that um, because it, it could be used for the following year, if that makes sense. I, I feel yeah. like I'm talking and in my head more than how in 24, 25 to be utilized in 25, 25 26. 26. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. Which again, like, I would rather not do that. I'd rather us look at, review the budget and try to fit everything in with where we can. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's always an option as well as. Um, if this bill were to pass, because then it could be used for the following year. Um, so I think it is seven o'clock. So I'll see how you stop <laughs> talking. Uh, Ms. Roller, sorry, we get to the uh, website Square. discussion. We'll get there in June, I promise. There will be no delegate assembly to discuss. Um, but I think. Well, Mr. Payne, you know that I didn't forget about her July 1st uh, promise. Oh. Uh. <laughs> she did. Um, yeah, I meant to say August 1st. Right. The uh, website, you said you were giving him that deadline. It was a few months ago. Um, I never said that to that. <laughs> I want to just finish up by wishing happy all our teachers a uh, happy teacher. You said we have something for <laughs> um, Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you for all you do um, for our students and for our community. And have a happy nurses, nurses week. Happy oh, Nurses Week. I haven't turned nurses. off yet. Um, <laughs> happy half birthday to myself. No, it's it is my half birthday, but that's not really a thing to uh, my family. And it gets mine, you know. <laughs> All right, and have a good night, everybody. Okay, good night. Thank, Thank you. you.